Cinema back, another dish. How we doing out there? Good, great, great, yand, a yand, a yand, wonderful. So, as you see on your screen right now, uh, listen, however you're joining us today, if you're not watching on the screen, it's on your phone, whatever, we appreciate you. But as you see on your screen, we're gonna we're gonna go back. We're gonna go back almost 40 years at this point, I think. Did, did I do math right? I think oh, close to 40 years. Uh, and I was I was thinking about this a, as I was, you know, doing my half ass notes for the fucking show. I don't think I have done a sports film on the show. I don't know. A, a good host would have went back to check to see if that was if I was telling falsehoods or not. But I'm pretty sure I did not. Uh, I haven't done a sports film, but this gets it, it gets even funnier here. So I hadn't done a sports film, which is kind of unlike me because I'm I'm a sports fan. I just don't talk about it to anyone because I think you attract a wrong crowd pending, you know, like, oh, go Ohio State. And it's like, well, did you go there? Did you have any family members that went there? No, you didn't. So why are you diehard? We don't need to do that right now. But but what's funny is um, I was actually going to do this film maybe even a couple of years ago, because you guys know that I like to try to do ones that you, you know, you may have not uh, heard of, or perhaps didn't get the love uh, when it was initially released, because like, you know, will I, would I do an episode on major league or slap shot or Rudy or something like that? I would, but you guys know all of those, you know, and this one young blood, as you see on your, your screen right now, I, I was like, well, this one has to be done. Cause I know for a fact that most people don't know about it. Well, Fast forward about a year and a half, and I have just a good egg, a goddamn good egg on my show back in April. Uh, and we did the show. We had a good time. And we mutually agreed, like, hey, we're going to stay in touch. And, you know, however, you know, whatever comes next, you know, let's find something that the both of us can do. And he he had messaged me, I don't know, a couple weeks, few weeks after a couple months. I don't even know. I don't know. It's been a whirlwind, as I was telling him uh, be, before we rolled tape here. Um, it he he had mentioned to me like, hey, would you be interested in doing a sports film? And he had listed a few. Actually, I don't know if he was specifically talking sports, but he had mentioned uh, like four or five films. And Youngblood was one of those films. And I was like, I, I messaged it back right away. I was like, we're not we're not going to do like, oh, which one should we do? We're doing Youngblood and that's going to be the end of it. And uh, and he was totally down. It was and it, for me. I think that's why, you know, I shit on on this show all the time about, you know, it's a fucking waste of time for anybody listening to it. Blah, blah, blah. I shit on it all the time. But I tell you what, like. You know, I, I do do that for entertainment value, theatrical value, but when you it, it's nice to have a platform like this where you do get to connect with people that do share similar interests with you, because I'm I'm telling you right now, I'm sitting in a place right now, at least if we're talking in terms of my like close knit friends group. There's not anyone within a hundred mile radius that I could talk to about this film. I mean, I'm sure somebody's seen it, but like at this level. Um, so it was nice to get that DM and I'm like, dude, we're doing young blood. This is just the, the, like there, there's no conversation over it. And I, I was just like, we got to make this happen. Now I had to drag my feet because I fucking, you know, I, I do shit life happens, but uh, we were finally able to get a date and here we are going to discuss the 1986 uh, we'll, we'll we'll get into whether or not it's a classic or not sports classic young blood back in april i had a gentleman on my show uh who was promoting 
his psychological horror film, Brian Loves You, which still is in my tops for 2022 in terms of originality. There's no question about that. I had such a good time with that film and he was such a good guest to have on. I, I think he offered, it's nice to, in, in my experience with this show, I would say 60 to 70% of the time you my guests are just kind of reacting to what I'm saying or going through the motions. And it wasn't the case with him. I think he, he comes from not only is he super genuine, but his intelligence, like, I don't even like on some level when, when we're talking, I don't even feel like I should be in the same room as him because he is light years more intelligent than I am. So, but to not only kind of have that camaraderie, and have him agree to come back on the show like I was just fucking elated. So, writer, director of Brian Loves You and Takeout, which both are on Tubi right now. I have mentioned Tubi on this show. I don't even know how many times. That's a that's a gold mine waiting to happen. Like if you haven't explored Tubi or even Pluto for that matter, you're you're kind of missing out. Anyway, I'm derailing. I'm derailing. Writer and director of Brian Loves You and Takeout, both on Tubi right now, sir. Seth Landau joining the podcast for the motherfucking sequel, which just happens to be Youngblood, the 1986 Rob Lowe, Patrick Swayze. Uh, we got uh, Cynthia Gibb. I still think Cynthia Gibb is and I know it. you shouldn't talk like this because it's toxic, but she's still gorgeous today. Like I I was watching that just going, oh, yeah, I remember just how in love with her. Oh, is Seth, Seth, Wait, you- Wayne, I'll call you back. I'm- yeah, yeah, we're doing it right now. Young blood. <laughs> I know. All right. One. That was Wayne Gretzky. Sorry. I know that's super rude. I'm, I apologize. No, I mean, what I, I'm I'm gonna be honest with you. What he couldn't come on the show? Like he he he, he couldn't he just... wanted to. I said there's no room, baby. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's already two greats. We don't need a third great one. So. Correct. So, Seth, like, I mean, we both have a mutual love for this film, but I remember and correct me if I'm wrong and I and I totally could be wrong. Did you say back in the DMs when we were talking about this, is this one of your favorites or your favorite sports film of all time? Uh, One of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, One of my favorite sports movies of all time. Obviously, I I personally think it's the best hockey uh, hockey movie ever made. I'm a lot of people. A generation prior to mine would probably say slap shot. A lot of the younger folks might say goon. Is it goon? The the Sean. Yep. The, yep. Yep. Goon. Young blood. <laughs> it's the best hockey movie ever made. Hands uh, down. And for those of you that don't know uh, what young blood is, and I don't know if you saw this when you were preparing for it, Seth or not, but uh, young blood, 1986 sports drama film. It was actually released in the Philippines as fight for your love or fight for love. I don't know if, if you know I that or not. That. I saw a body check in Germany, I believe. Body check? That's mm-hmm. that's yeah. classic. So it's yeah. a 1986 American sports drama written, directed, and produced by Peter Markle, starring Rob Lowe, Cynthia Gibb, Patrick Swayze. And I don't know why we don't talk about this more, but it was uh, Keanu Reeves, I think, first or second yes. feature film. He looks I think it was his so, first. so young in this. And mm-hmm. talk about, mm-hmm. like, I, you know, I didn't know who that was when I was first watching watching this film. You know, you knew Patrick Swayze and you knew Rob Lowe with those pouty lips, you know, mm-hmm. and I now going back on it. So, so you you went back in and watched it what, yesterday, the day before I watched it over the weekend. Um, I, I so I, I grew up with this movie. It was I was 10 when it came out. It was one of the things that got me more into hockey. Uh, as a young uh, person, it, was, it used to be on TV with a TV editor for a while. So I, I've seen the cinematic cut. I've seen the TV cut. I've been watching it for however many years it's been out for the most part. Um, yeah. And, and I hadn't seen it as an adult, really, until this past weekend. So it looks a little different as an adult. Did you did you play hockey growing up? Yeah, this I brought I I unearthed my stick. Uh, so I from New York, there's a lot of street hockey, deck hockey, not a ton of ice where I was from on Long Island for whatever reason. I played a little bit of ice hockey when I moved to Arizona, ironically, but for most of my hockey was stuff like this, uh, like street hockey, roller hockey. I was out there after school every day shooting on the goal. I, I 
earlier in my college uh, life, some of my friends used to play for the ASU hockey team, which is now Division One, but it was a club team back then. They, they weren't like official uh, uh, D1 until more recently. But uh, I played with some, messed around with some good people. So I, it's just one of those things that was always in my life as a kid. Yeah, uh, me too. In fact, that opening sequence uh, on the, the home video footage that we actually start off with, um, very similar. If I did a visual element to the show, if I if I decided I wanted to take the time to edit, which I never will do, um, I, I would put in here, there's a great picture of me uh, in the local paper, uh, young, we're talking five, six, uh, with our homemade neck that was just wood and chicken wire that we would put in the truck take over to the pond next to our house and, and, and do our thing. But it literally, like when I was watching the opening sequence, I was like, Oh man, like on some level, take me back dude. take me, take me back to 89. And I, I, I would, I would definitely, cause what ended up happening, you played hockey. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Actually, yes. Yeah. The, what what kind of bums me out? Take me back because what ended up happening with me is that by the time I had got to high school, we didn't have a hockey team. Like you would have to like it was almost outsourced. You would be like a collection. Same. Uh, yeah. And I just I was like, all right, I guess we're playing baseball and football. And that's what it was. But I always hated that because I never really liked football as much as I hockey is easily my favorite sport, um, it, at least to play. I think I mean, playoff hockey would probably be my second favorite to watch behind UFC, but huge, huge hockey fan ever since I can remember. But like I said, the the opening VHS sequence, I was just like, oh, man, remember when times were simpler, bro? Remember I, lo- I love. OK, so I'm going to I love a lot of things about this movie. I think it's just really well made filmmaking but there are some things about this movie where i'm just like and that's how i am with the movies that i love i'm not the kind of fanboy that just loves everything sometimes a movie is flawless like godfather or let me think of a recent movie that's just like pretty uh like heat would be something more recent and even maybe the social network in a way so you know to me rarely is a film just like start to finish airtight you know no problems whatsoever some of my favorite movies like in the sports realm, uh, Major League or a Youngblood um, or, or Rudy. Uh, actually, Rudy is probably in the flawless. Youngblood is not flawless, is my point. I've, there are things here that for me are like way cringe that we can get into, um, but I still love the movie. So just know that as I'm talking about this movie, I love this movie. And even though I there are parts of it that are, as mentioned, like very kind of cringy, like that, I say it with love. I mean, I, I would I would be the same as you like the the stuff that that if you would call it cringe, I I chalk up to when it was released. You know what I'm saying? There, yeah, there was a certain there was a certain kind of structure that you would have to adhere to for studios. And I mean, you see that, you know, here, I still think, like you said, I would agree that it's airtight. Like we have everything we need, whether it's, you know, you're, we're making a new friend and Derek, you know, we have our villain actually, before we get into our villain, I, I want you to ponder something. Yeah. I saw that this movie, it did almost double what uh, it cost to make. I think it did like 16 mil uh, box office and it cost eight or nine to make, but I was thinking, what would have been easy and what would have, you know, people would talk about young blood more is if Carl Racky was Russian and he was like Carl Rackna Rackney off. And we had the whole Ivan we, Drago. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like yeah. why they're standing center ice, you know, I, I must break you or whatever, whatever the case exactly. may be. I- iconic line. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking, I was like, you know what, the reason why this movie didn't succeed is as much as it, it could have is because we weren't have nation or we didn't have nations colliding. And that mm-hmm. that was that was the big like draw political. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a bipartisan hockey film. <laughs> so so something something to mention right off the bat is so what's interesting about a lot of these studio films back then. So you had Peter Markle, who was a director who I this is the only movie I've ever seen that he did. And I looked at his credits, you know, just doing due diligence before we recorded. He has a handful of movies. I'm sure some of them are good. He has a ski movie that I had heard of. Um, But like, I'm the kind of person where the movies that I know I love and I I can talk about them for days, but I'm not a cinephile in the sense where I see everything. Um, So Peter Markle's movies, I'd imagine some of them are as solid as Youngblood and maybe some not, who knows. But 
the producers, I think, had a heavy hand in the way that this movie appears. So, you know, Peter Goober and John uh, Goober Peters. So they were OK. So John Peters, Vision Quest, Legend of Billie Jean, Inner Space, Rain Man, 1989, Batman. I'm sorry, that was Peter Gruber. John Peters, a lot of those same titles add on with honors, Money Train, Batman Returns. So these guys, one or the other, or both as a team had a hand in quite a few movies with broad appeal, popcorn movies that were very solid. So I'd almost say the producers had a more solid track record than the director. And the director, who is clearly technically skilled and a former hockey player, jumped into the mix of these guys with like a finger on the pulse who were cranking out a lot of very enjoyable movies and the mix just worked. You had the popcorn sensibility with the competent, talented Artur talent. Yeah. More, not just competent, talented Artur and it worked. Well, I think, and to your point of kind of having a good producer team is uh, the addition of Mark Irwin, the DP on this film, who's done Scanners, Videodrome, The Dead Zone, mm-hmm. uh, an underrated one, The Protector with Jackie Chan, The Fly, The Blob, Fright Night 2, RoboCop 2, even though we, we don't talk about RoboCop 2, Tales from the Crypt, Showdown in Little Tokyo, The Mighty Ducks, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, Dumb and Dumber, Vampire and Bru- he actually, a lot of talent. Yeah, yeah, man. Actually, he's got two of my favorite comedies of all time, which is Dumb and Dumber and Kingpin. He's got two of those Scream he did. But I think be, with that, all shot it, well. Yeah, right. Like, and and yeah. it was I, I didn't it didn't even click to me until like you. I I started doing some of the research, and I'm like, oh shit! Like, it's no wonder that this this film looks as good as it does. You have a veteran you know, uh, handling business for you. And I think it goes back to your point of you have a strong producing team in there. Like they're not going to, they're not going to let you fall flat on your face. So I think with the, you know, a first time guards. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like people don't understand just how I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, especially you being a filmmaker and me being a failed one, wouldn't you, wouldn't you rather, yeah, yeah, wouldn't you, well, that's the good thing about filmmaking is that it doesn't matter what fucking age, like there's no, there's no shelf life on uh, being an artiste, but I, I, I'm curious as to where was I going with this shit? Um, nope, it's gone. You, you were going from the filmmaker's perspective of probably how the movie was constructed. Um, I, I, what was I going for? From the filmmaker's perspective, I guess, uh, oh, you, um, would you, from the filmmaker's perspective, wouldn't you agree to a certain extent that you can, if money is an issue, which making movies, I'm sure you would agree, it always fucking is. It doesn't doesn't matter if you're shooting a big budget film or a low budget film, money's always a fucking issue. Budget's always an issue. Wouldn't you rather, and I think this is why this film succeeds to an extent, wouldn't you rather dump your money into a good cinematographer, into um, good sound, sound designer, that sort of thing. And almost, I, I, for lack of a better phrase, you don't pay your cast, really, because I think to to a degree, you can make a really good film without well-known people as long as it looks and sounds good. I really believe that. Like, as long as the story is relatively well, it doesn't matter who's on the screen. If you have it sounding well and looking well and the story works, I think you can save some money. Yes. Uh, you know, in in most cinema, the above the line is going to be a, a large part of the budget. It, it depends on the scale of the production. So certain independent films, when you have... A-list stars in small movies, they're going to get what, like, you know, uh, between 60 to 70 percent of the budget and the below the line is just going to have to make do, which is a lot of times why you see minimal locations, uh, you know, practical uh, storytelling just because a lot of the money was allocated to the top line cast. So in a movie like Youngblood, which is more studio, I'd imagine that they even though it's lower budget and, you know, adjusting for inflation, I don't even know what that would be considered today, maybe still a mid-sized budget, but um, you're going to probably have enough to pay to get the crew that you need. Um, still though your your top actors are going to get a sizable chunk of the budget but i think in the world of young blood and studio films you're you're not going to be short on cast if you're talking indie then oh yeah that's a problem on quite a few productions where you've got um forrest whitaker and bruce willis and some other guys but the production may only have like you know several days with them because they're so expensive so 
um, that's when you have to kind of walk that line. I have a completely unrelated question. Uh, did I hear right that Bruce Willis had like a thing that that's going on with him, right? Health wise, right? I just looked that up the other day. I think he has some condition that affects his memory skills or yeah, memory yeah. or he has some kind of atrophy. Yeah. Um, and somehow he's released like 13 films in a year and a half. And I was yeah, a worker. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. well, because I, I was I actually had Jesse Johnson on the show not too long ago. Follow Jesse Johnson if you don't know who he is. And he was just like, hey, look, we're not we're not talking about Bruce Willis or whatever. And, and I, you know, I respect that. It's fine or whatever. But you saying that I was like, man, I just like the other day I saw like three more films that Bruce Willis is in. And I'm like, how the fuck? I thought, well, maybe, you know, whatever. <laughs> anyway, yeah. let's let's kind of let's you want to you want to go down the line on this film and just kind of start from the beginning and and just kind of just i was just thinking that uh, even when, as you mentioned that the opening scene to me is is a perfect way to open the story where you've got like the super eight footage of you establish the relationship of rob Lowe and his brother right off the bat so i believe what is supposed to be the setup is the father is filming and then you see the neighborhood kids playing street of uh, ice hockey uh street hockey version of ice hockey and then you basically see that dean is fast and talented and he pisses off the older, bigger kids. Uh, at one point, he gets knocked to the knocked on his ass, and then his brother comes in and sticks up for him. And I, I think that's a beautiful way to set up the story because that, that, that tells you who Dean Youngblood is right off the bat. So it, a lot of this movie is great storytelling, and that's example one. Minus the part where he starts off left-handed, and then as he's <laughs> older, he's he's right-handed. But that's that's here nor there. I, yes. you know, sometimes you see shit, but but that, but you know, to an extent, you can make the argument that that's very realistic. Is that when you when you're younger and whatever? Obviously, this is when you're learning. But I I did did know plenty of kids that you know batted left-handed or shot right-handed or whatever, and then as they grew older, they switched to right-handed just because for whatever reason. Um, but in in this, I was just like, no, dude, you were left hand and I'm left handed. So I was annoyed, like I'm biased because I, I shoot the puck left handed. So I was like, oh, wait a minute. Why is he not? Why Me too. I'm right handed, but I, I I hockey and golf left handed. And I actually did not notice it. I saw that in the trivia, what you just mentioned. But I I'm usually really good about picking out continuity. But I I missed that one completely. I'm, I'm the same as you, dude. I, I shoot left handed. I bat left handed. I write right handed, throw right handed. Uh, I kick right-handed, but for the most part, everything else is left. It doesn't make any fucking sense at all. Yep. <laughs> at all. So after we, uh, after we cut from the VHS sequence, we're now, it's now older Dean. Now older Dean, his brother and his dad looks like a, um, just your typical blue collar Midwestern farm that, uh, Dean is, is working on. And we cut, we cut right to the quick. Like as soon as he sits down, we know Dean's plan. Like Dean is like, Hey, look, uh, I'm going to try out for this hockey team. I, and, and the dad just kind of like looks at him stairs and he's like, look, there's going to be scouts there. And if I don't do this, you know, there's no possible way that I can get to the pros and in typical, I don't want to say popcorn movie fashion, but in traditional story structure, well, we know that the dad just doesn't want any of that. You know, the dad, the dad, that, which we learn there's a reason to that. But the dad basically says, hey, we we need you on the farm. Like I, I you know, what did uh, your brother get? And, you know, the brother's older now, too. And I love I love the their choice. Like we just did kind of the discolored eye as opposed of this like stupid over the top scar that his brother, you well, know, like an eye, eye patch or anything he, they could have <laughs> saddled him with. And, and I never noticed the two different color eyes until I saw this on disc. So for the first however many years that I saw this movie on either VHS quality or tube TV, I didn't even pick that out. Yeah. And, and you, and, but this is kind of like where that movie magic comes in. So now like we aren't even 15 minutes into the film and we're already, we already get a sense of who Dean is, where he's coming from. And we've said mm. very little, which, you know, I, 
in terms of a hook, what more do you need? You know, he, he's got a dad that doesn't want him to leave because he, you know, he'd be better suited on the farm. I think the dad says something to the extent of, uh, what are you going to do? You know, your brother, all he got when he tried out was a, a stick to the eye and a hospital mm-hmm. bill for which, by the way, he mentions that the hospital bill was $2,000. And I was like, Oh my God, the, mm-hmm. you, you, if you lived right now, you wouldn't be bitching that it was only a $2,000 inflation <laughs> again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would I would say that so, something that I see as a through line in this movie is that they do less with more off. I think this the script is extremely well written where in, in the rule of writing is generally speaking, you know, say say as little as you absolutely can or or another way to say it would be don't waste words. And I think this movie does that perfectly where not a word is is wasted and and so the dialogue is very concise and to the point all characters across the board i think this movie does that really well where i never get bored and they're not over expositioning so i think right off the bat this breakfast scene is an example of how it's setting up the character this this is basically luke on the farm in star wars wanting more than to be a farmer and to go and do something bigger and you know in star wars it's an uncle in this movie it's a father the father wants him to stay you know, within the roost and there's a stable life for you here. And the kid brother probably wanted what Dean wanted and says, you know, let him go, let him, let him have a shot. And also, I don't know if you noticed this, I don't see too many kind of goofy studio product placement things in this movie, although the hockey rinks have a ton of ads, but on this, in this scene, there is every consumer product available. There is Mrs. Butterworth, McCormick's pepper, Rice Krispies, Raisin Bran. How much food do these guys eat? Everything is on that table. Heinz ketchup, every brand from the 80s is on the table. Well, yeah, dude, they're farmers. They, you know, you got, they, they're grown, my friend. Load up. <laughs> Load up before they rally on the farm, right? I, I did, that struck me as like, that is a little excessive, but not many moments like this with like questionable production design in this movie. But, you know, if you watch that uh, YouTube channel, Everything Wrong With, they often point out candles and lamps, which I never have noticed in movies until I watch those videos. So, you know, things like that give me a more discerning eye when it comes to, oh, yeah, there are a lot of lamps. There are a lot of candles. In this scene, there's a lot of food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, There's a lot of GMO food on that table. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's only the three of them. And yet the mom, the mom cut and run a long time ago. She had had it with the hockey and the farm shit. She was like, I'm out. Maybe of there here. was too much food for her. She was, she was <laughs> repulsed by the consumerism of, of the family at home. I've had anyway, it with so process shit. I've had it with this process shit. <laughs> She wanted to eat organic, and that's why she left. So, uh, yeah, a perfect setup. It establishes it really well. And something that when we lead into the next scene that I think this movie does extremely well is that it keeps shit moving. It doesn't linger too long. So he gets up, and the father, the father, brother, older brother had that kind of like Sato voice conversation where, you know, he's just a little kid. Let him let him go. He'll be back in a couple of weeks with his tail between his legs. Of course, Rob Lowe is looking over. He can hear it, but they're doing it kind of like quasi subtly. And you smash cut to the Trans Am coming at the camera. It, I, I like how they don't waste time with like, all right, Dean, you can go. But if it, like they, 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 they cut through that, they, they basically, the father you can tell is apprehensive. The big brother wants to give the little brother a shot. Boom, cut, they're in the car and they're on the way. And, and I love how this movie, which I believe is about 90 minutes, it just keeps the action moving. It never slows down. It doesn't waste words. And they do a bunch of smash cuts. I think their transitions, the transitions in this movie, one of my favorite parts. I, I, it, just, I think, it gets you energized. I think you're right. Like, I think if this film were to come out 10 years prior, we would have had 10 or 12 more minutes of dean trying to get out of the house you know what i'm saying or possibly like unnecessary dialogue exactly stupid subtext and backstories you don't need yeah like the instead of it just being at the dinner table we would have shifted into the living room later and later on in the night dad are you sure i can't go to the you know and it glad that we didn't do that and you're right like it is it it is i don't want you to go the dad or or the brother is just like oh let him go let him get the shit kicked out of him and he'll be back here you know this tail between his legs two weeks later like don't don't worry about it and then boom trans am we are headed to the to the rink for tryouts which it's another thing about this movie too. Like there's so many elements of this that it's very hard for me not to think about my childhood. Like the first rink I actually ever played in that wasn't a fucking pond 
it's out in the middle of nowhere, just like that, dude. Like it's run down a little bit, just like that. Like, and I start, I'm like, oh my God, fuck Tam O'Shanner. That was, that was the rink that, that I started. I'm like, holy fuck. Like, dude, everything about this, and which is why I think, I tend to grab it. No disrespect to Slapshot or Miracle or um, did you like mm-hmm. Mystery Alaska? Didn't see it. Oh, OK. I see it. I think is it was- a hockey movie? I thought that was like a crime drama. No. Hockey no. movie. Uh, what are what are you thinking of? Uh, I don't know. Far, I mean, far, not Fargo, but it sounds it, it, it rings Fargo ish with the title. But no, I haven't seen it. Mystery Alaska actually has Russell Crowe in it. Okay. And it's a hockey movie. Hockey movie. I watch it. I will watch it. I love the sport. Yeah. Yeah. Check it out. And, and I think why I gravitate towards this one a little bit more is it does take itself serious where I think slap shot is slap shot. Doesn't really, don't get me wrong. Like the, the social um, commentary, the culture commentary in slap shot, like it's, it's gold, you know, Mm -hmm. but I, I like how we somehow managed in this film to balance a good seriousness, but not too serious. What am I trying to say? Miracle is 110% all serious. We are all in on the drama. Whereas sap Disney. Absolutely. Yeah. Whereas I do think there are moments of this, um, uh, where it's it's not taking itself serious for, for example, just cause I I have it on right now and I'm, I'm watching Cynthia Gibb, but Cynthia Gibb freaking out in her classroom during finals when, you know, way uh, to go young blood. Yeah. 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 So, and and you wouldn't see that in miracle. You're not going to see that in Mm -hmm. slap shot. So I do think there's kind of, I, I hesitate to say genius, but an ingenious way of kind of weaving the two, the popcorn flick with something that, Ah, you learn something you feel about something so anyway as i derailed there we're actually at the rink now and it's tryout times and the first we introduce you talk about by the way before before they go into the rink i I like that moment where i i again like the relationships in this movie are so well done where dean is fairly immature throughout this entire movie until i think the very end and so he gets out of the car He's not afraid, but he says, you want to come in and the big brother, you know, like what and hold your hand, you're on your own Bye. you know, so it's like that, that tough love from the father from the brother and and I I just I appreciate that the father is stern he he's, you know, vacillating on whether he's okay with his son going but he ultimately lets him go. The brother gives him a ride, but they're not gonna coddle him I, I, I think it's like the perfect balance, the relationships in this movie. Um, I'm so I just want to mention that before we get inside the ring. No, just really I, well I'm, done. I'm glad that you mentioned that because actually, so two questions. One, we do, we, I do like to ponder some of life's questions. So, and I'm, and I, and I didn't tell you about this before we started rolling just because I, the first reaction is the best reaction. Uh-oh. Is calling a Canadian a wetback racist? I remember that. I thought, <laughs> I guess not. I don't I, think so, right? I don't know. I don't know that. That's why like, this is what I like to do to people, even in my personal life. I just ask questions that I don't have the answer to. And I don't even have a. No, I get it. That I'm and that like, struck me. There are a couple of things that you see in this movie that you would not see in a movie today. I mean, even I, re- I remember when I was talking with Dan Roebuck about takeout when I was interviewing him for the Brian Loves You DVD, he or Blu-ray, he he said something to the effect of that character I played in takeout, which was a tobacco company CEO that was smoking on a golf course. He said, you couldn't even do that today. And Dan is working in movies all the time. And obviously he knows the tone. And that struck me as like, what? <laughs> like guns and coffee and 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 uh, cigarettes are like across the board in all movies. Did something change? And so when Dan said that, I thought, are, is there no smoking allowed anymore? So like, so obviously certain words, I mean, you know, <laughs> different, I don't know how you'd call them, like the F word, the N word. I mean, certain words were were abundant throughout 80s cinema. And obviously you would never hear them today. And and things in this movie, they they get there. So the the wetback, uh, the, Amer- the Americans are wetback? I mean, uh, no, the, the Canadians are the, or no, no, no. Yes. The no, Amer- the Americans, the wetback. Yeah, the Americans, the wetback. And we're just playing, we're just playing their game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, I wasn't offended by that. If somebody called me a wetback when I was in Canada, I'd say, well, all right, like, I don't even get the, I don't get that. But, sure. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, well, because here's the thing, like to me and you, like it was like, I don't know, you just you just go whatever, like it's not a thing. But I I picture like a 19 or 20 something, you know, watching this for the first time and being like, whoa, whoa, man. Oh, of course. And, and, yeah, and, like the woke, just, the woke reviews you see across yeah. YouTube. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> you can't say that. They're out of touch. He's talking Maybe. about an American, though. He's talking about us, though. Yeah, like, that's why it didn't like like hit me weird or anything. I'm like, all right, I guess that's a thing. Sometimes in movies, I just like I see things. I'm like, eh, I just let it go, you know. I do the uh, to close out that scene though. I do love that line though, um, and and I actually you know he's he's not in it a lot, but I think the brother, uh, what is his name? Hold on a second, I Jim I, Youngs, I believe. Yes, yes, you're right, Jim Youngs. Um, when he's just like. Pah. They'll never Dean Youngblood's like, they'll never, yeah, if they can catch him. And he's like, oh, they'll catch you. Oh, yeah, they'll catch Love you. And then, yeah. And then we're in the rink and I'm like, yeah, they would. Yeah, they fucking would. Yeah, like, your your right. brother knows what's up. You are you are a deer in headlights right now. Really good foreshadowing as well. Throughout this movie, they do. I mean, they do a lot of things really well in this movie. Uh, not only scene transitions, not only dialogue, foreshadowing. And that's that's one example of excellent foreshadowing. They'll never catch me because they've never caught me before in my life in my 17 years. Oh, they'll catch you. Yeah. So and well that, done. That's, and that's really how it is, too, dude. I thought like I'm like, I'm so fucking fast. These dudes like I, I don't hit people. I don't get into fights. I'm just mm -hmm. going to skate around people. And then by the time I was getting into my teens, I'm like, oh, all right. Well, there are a few people that uh, can can keep my pace. But uh, yeah, and again, then smash cut to the tryouts. Uh, just like they keep it moving. And the, and the hockey action in this movie is top rate uh like top notch first rate so um so right off the bat you see that it's not going to be this idyllic life that he has envisioned he he has a little success he scores some goals and then who's introduced that brings him back down to earth carl rakinoff no that's not his name it's it, it's what is his name? Yeah, yeah, Rachmaninoff. <laughs> that's what his name should have been but it's carl it's carl racky who actually um uh, I believe the actor himself, uh, where's he at? Uh, George Finn uh, played a little hockey, played a little amateur hockey himself. Hockey in, player. In, yeah, in real life. And mm. sadly enough, and I only say sadly because of how well he did, even though it's kind of a... Um, his character's downplayed to to an extent until the end where we just we, we get obnoxious with mm. stick fighting and everything else. Yeah. But I... In terms, he's so believable as that character. It's sad to think that this was his last film. Like he was just yeah. like he did Young Blood, and then that was it. There, like maybe one other role, and then he. So I, I I read a story that was written about him in a in a Toronto paper actually, and uh, it basically said he was like a hockey player that got a role because the director was a hockey player. They he filled out a lot of the extra supporting players with hockey players, so. Uh, so Racky was no different than that. And he just happened to be a great actor. Like for all, I, like when I was a kid, I thought all these guys were actors. I mean, everybody did an excellent job. I would say the weakest actors in this entire movie is Rob Lowe and he does a passable job, yeah. but the, he's surrounded by great performances, even from non-actors. So Racky to me could have been a tough guy on movies, but I think I read a quote in the story about him that basically said he now lives in central New York, or he did as of very recently, like a couple of years ago, he basically said, you know, hockey was kind of done for me. It didn't work out. I played in the minors. I didn't really get more acting roles. So he kind of took normal jobs and he's in central New York. Now that's just for character actors. Sometimes that how that's how it goes. So a character actor, like the coach Chadwick had a lengthy career in a bunch of great movies and he's a great, he was a great performer. And sometimes it just doesn't take off. Somebody who maybe comes from stunts or sports, he, he dabbles in movies and he has a good role or two. And then it just kind of peters out. And that's just, that's life sometimes. And that's a bummer too, because I do think he has a great character actor face. Um, he would have been great. I think so. Yeah, like I was just I I did a show a couple of days ago. Uh, the Leech, shout out to the Leech, Eric Penikoff. Um, but uh, there's a gentleman in that one, uh, Jeremy Gardner, who to me, like, you could literally work for the rest of your life because of how character actor your face is which i it sounds demeaning to the actor but i don't mean it like that at all but i just think you could consistently work and it's kind of a bummer that we didn't see george kind of just carry out be the be the new tom atkins if you will or whatever you know right. that you're just like hey i don't know his name but i know that fucking face i've seen mm -hmm. him in this 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 and mm -hmm. it's just kind of a bummer but anyway carl's a bruiser 
Carol. Yeah, I, I love how they set up this this introduction scene to this this league. How you have the veterans uh, in the rafters looking down to see what's going on in tryout. So you're introduced to Patrick Swayze and Hewitt and the rest of the gang. You have the coaches in the box, and and I love uh, I love. Uh, Chadwick and his assistant coach, they have a really good back and forth dynamic. Then the assistant coach is very Ed McManish where it's just like kind of a sidekick, but he does a lot of good reaction shots and he just kind of grounds the, the coaching staff, which is really just technically it's more than two people, but it's just portrayed as really the head and the assistant coach. Um, And it's just like the way that the action is set up and framed. It's just a great stage. I love how they do that. And then there's people like me who couldn't get, it out of his head that this man watching the tryouts was smoking a cigarette in the ring yeah, smoking I, all the time in the yeah. locker room in the rink and i'm surprised he's not smoking during the game <laughs> yeah, I mean, he did i was sitting there i was like man times have changed times have changed yeah quite a yeah. bit here because he he's, yeah. he's sitting here he's bored side just chain smoking he's just like ah yeah. you know just talking about who he's seeing you know oh you know, that carl rack he's got 378 penalty minutes blah, 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 blah. and i'm just like holy fuck like people don't understand we used to smoke on planes we yeah <laughs> restaurants planes <laughs> hockey rings and, yeah. and so basically they set it up really early where he says that's kelly's kid brother so like it's known who dean youngblood is there's a little bit of a family legacy there and then i like that moment where you know dean's having a lot of success initially because you know the, these clowns that he's playing around can't can't keep up with him and then you know the action breaks and he says uh put racky across from him and then you get a, one of the first of many great reaction shots from the assistant coach like you little w and so like the, the score comes in another thing this movie does extremely well is the score um and and that's the first face off puck is dropped uh racky cross checks him across the uh the brow and like as a kid i'm i'm so afraid of carl racky at this moment well, that's another thing, too, is like I can even remember thinking as a kid, like, hey, is he going to get a penalty for that? Or like, are we so we penalties just at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, why are they allowed to use their stick in abundance in this film during like, a tryout? Like, wouldn't somebody like shove him? I mean, like, this is just a rough league. I mean, it's even said in moments like Racky's rough, even for this league. So it is. And, and as growing up, I watched a lot of minor league, minor league hockey in Phoenix. There used to be an IHL team called the Phoenix Roadrunners. If you, I can't, how am I moving? So behind me, <laughs> yeah, behind me right there is a program from the Phoenix Roadrunners. So, I mean, I, I grew up watching a lot of minor league hockey. It, it was more violent than the NHL. I would probably imagine there were more. Oh, fights. yeah. Oh, yeah. So Our maybe team. this is just passable. Yeah. Our in the team. context. Our team is the Walleyes here in Toledo, which is the Red Wings farm team or whatever. And that's literally mm -hmm. the only reason why people go is like, we know we're going to see five to seven fights mm -hmm. and that's what it's all about. And I'm like, well, I don't so know. So maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe they just, you know, it's just, it's allowed. I mean, but to me, it's like uh, during a tryout, I don't know. And, and at the, okay. So basically uh, he gets knocked down, young blood goes up and he checks him. And I love that, that, that line from Swayze when he says, uh, no, it was Hewitt, but uh, they, they cut to the guys watching the action on the ice. And he says, look at that. He's going for it. I don't know why that line just really sticks with me. I just love that, that inner cut, like narrating what's happening. Young blood checks him and then he scores. And then Racky again, puts him on his ass. And then I, I love like the, the inner workings of hockey as portrayed in this movie. And so both guys, uh, Hewitt and Swayze, stay down. So, you know, they're, they're, they're just like, don't get up, dude. And then he, of course, like an idiot, and he's immature, he stands up, Racky challenges him. I guess Dean thinks this is what he has to do in order to make the team. And to me, he, this is one of the problems I have, one of the few problems I have with this movie and the action. So, you know, Racky goads him. You want to go? And he has a Canadian accent. You want to go, pretty boy? Hey, you want to go? You know, and, and as an adult, I noticed a Canadian accent a lot more than I did as a kid. You're like, oh, come on, coach. We don't want to practice now, coach. Yeah. And so, you know, Racky, you want to go? You want to go? And which to me as an adult, a little less threatening. When do you sound? You know? <laughs> but because Canadians always sound nice to me. And so like, so this is, so Dean goes half in, which is part of the reason he gets knocked out. He throws down his stick. His gloves aren't even off. Racky hits him with a straight punch, puts him down, and that's it. So it's like, okay, why? why? And he didn't even he didn't even flinch. And granted, Rob Lowe is not a hockey player, but the director is good. The director is competent. The director shoots a lot of great hockey action in this movie. This is really the one of the only times in this movie where the hockey action didn't work for me because, yeah, Dean is an immature young kid, 
but it's like if you're gonna if you're gonna fight and throw down your stick your gloves are coming off but it's gloves never came off gets knocked out done so like that's the only thing where it's like dude don't just stand there with your hands at your hips waiting to get hit i mean at least you know at least put your hands up and later in the movie his big brother says keep your hands up you know they're so he's told later so he just has no idea what he's doing yeah we will definitely get to that montage because like that's my only caveat of the whole film is that we had to like I, he's only home for like 24 to 48 hours i, I was gonna yeah, say we, that too yeah, we'll get there we'll get there we'll, do, we'll do, get do, We'll get there, but you're you're. So what I was gonna say is that like basically the last thing that we see after the the gloves dropped is just like the coach basically going. He fights like an old lady. Like this is what do you know? But we give so me we the don't. idea that they're not gonna take him because he can't take care of himself. Yep. Yep. And then and then this is some of the beauty. Some some of the stuff that I was around growing up because uh, my my uh, stepdad played uh, played professionally in a couple of areas, but. So the locker room sequence, I don't know if that could have been more realistic in terms of what I grew up around, like just the whole vibe of mm -hmm. us being in the locker room, even down to an inexperienced cut man sewing someone up like right. i've seen that yeah. firsthand in a locker room right. just right. this dude getting sewed up and swigging whiskey as in the locker room we are between periods he's going back out like that was the environment that i was in so mm -hmm. i was just like holy shit like this is this is actually real this this right this environment I like that they they cut again another good cut they cut the guys were working out you get to see swayze with a shirt off i'm sure that was like in his contract those days there has to be an ass or a chest or some kind of shot he did the ass in roadhouse he did the chest in young blood i'm sure that was and I, the patrick swayze is like an angel on earth he could do no wrong in my eyes but I don't need to see him half naked, but I mean, you get you get the Swayze shirtless shot and the other guys working out. They had to split time, actually. So Swayze was allowed to do the chest and Rob Lowe got the ass. That's the only way that they were going to work. <laughs> I don't see that again. I think that's like a Goober Peters thing where it's like you got to get the man ass to get the women in the theater. You know, like I, that's got to be the cigar smoking producer. Yeah, we need more sex. Sex it up. I want more ass. I want tits. I mean, you know, just like you're not wrong, dude, because we do have two more sequences that are like we could cut this a little short if we wanted to with with the introduction of Miss McGill and the love interest. But like and even like right. with the love interest, uh, Cynthia Gibbs, like we, we're, I'm kind of like, all right, I got it. They're they're going to have sex now. Like we we can we, we can move on a little bit. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so we're. Ahead, so, so, so we're in, okay. So, so we're in, we're in the locker room afterwards and the coach is breaking into Racky that Racky's not going to make the team. And Rob Lowe's getting sewed up by the equipment manager who does needlepoint as well. And this, this is one of the moments I think. So I think this movie doesn't do gratuitous violence. It kind of does just enough. It's a little like, uh, you know, watching him get sewn because they, they really show it. Um, it, it it it's right on the edge of what would be like oh, that's too much violence it, it, it's just the right amount of violence throughout this movie and i i don't like violence movies at all but to me this is like for given the context this is what's necessary and so something that i really like about this scene is when they tell young blood that he makes the team the coach comes over he kind of gives him a look and he says get him a uniform he, he it's not like welcome to the team kid or you're it's it's Everything is done well with the dialogue. It reminds me of the scene in Rudy where when Rudy makes the team, they're outside the tunnel, they're in the tunnel outside of the locker room and the, and the coach says to him, um, you know, can you give this effort at all times? Will you let up? Will you, da, 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 you know, making sure that this kid is committed, you know, and then the coach says, because if you do, I'm going to throw your ass off the team. And then Rudy, of course, uh, like, well, I have to be on the team. Did I make it? And then the kid's like, yeah, don't let me down. I just like it in movies when you don't overtly say what is happening you you that and that's good writing and that's good character development so i i like how the the coach in this movie is he's tough and he doesn't really express his emotions very well so um again like great character development great great writing and he is tough he he was a fighter back in the yep. day the, the coach yep. was a, a fighter back in the day and kind of Going back um, just a few seconds of what you were saying, I, I do think when in doubt, downplay the scene. When yeah, in doubt, like, like what right. you're, yeah, what you're talking about is like, it's not just like, oh, and he's made the team and he's running out to the parking lot doing a fucking dance. Yeah, and he made the team. Yeah, right. yeah. And, and, and we 
we kind of just we downplay it and then we're on to the next scene like it like you you, you know no no just more like oh let's let's talk to the team in the locker room a little bit more it's very quick and mm-hmm. before you know it now he's on a fucking playoff team which that was another yeah. thing too that i was kind of weird is like they're doing tryouts for the playoffs Bam. it's weird yeah they- there are some logistical concerns with this movie but i guess you just have to like uh get, go with it sustained this is it sustained disbelief yeah i think i think that's a proper term yeah um, and i'm all right with that maybe they you know it's like when you get to your third string quarterback and you got to start looking in parking lots of lows for you know a new arm because yeah, you, you just yeah. don't have anybody so i mean it, so part of me thinks okay it could be argued that they should have taken Racky because Sutton can score. But so the only thing that I think saves it in the story for me is that Sutton is it as communicated with this movie, Sutton's the only one who can score goals. And so obviously they need another goal scorer, which is why Chadwick picked Youngblood. But to me, the Mustangs are incidentally, do you see my shirt? It's a Mustang shirt. Hell yeah. It's dude. like it's Hell a little, yeah. it's a little, it's a little crop, and I'm wearing my uh Hamilton Mustangs t-shirt. And like, of Fuck course, yeah, dude. not one person has ever recognized what that is, you know. Uh it's it's a below the radar movie. So um to me, the Hamilton Mustangs would call Racky probably a better overall team. You, you, Maybe. you, I don't you know. might actually be right. No, you're right, because you keep Sutton on the first line and then you bring in your bruiser for the fourth line with Racky. But or can put they him score on enough. That's that's true. I mean Sutton wouldn't have been taken out. You're right. You're that. Yeah, but that's yeah. that's neither here nor there. I mean, the, the movie wants to put Rob Lowe in the central character. You know, like I even saw something how the the director wanted this to be a grittier uh, hockey movie. He wanted to cast an actual hockey player in the in the role, but the studio and the producers they wanted like a hot young uh, lead. You know, so this is this is studio filmmaking in the eighties, of course. So and I think so we have su- Rob Lowe. Yeah, and I think he succeeded at that. I really do in making it like what would have been a grittier sports film up mm. until this point. I. I can't think of one off the top of my head, um, at least before 86, that where it did feel down and dirty like right. this film did. Um, but it, it worked. I'm glad to me, this is one of the examples of the studio was right. I, I think that the way it was portrayed in a more broad presentation worked better. It's more accessible to more people. I think you may have gotten more of the hard, the hard scrabble hockey crowd with a grittier movie, but the movie wouldn't have had as much appeal as it did it wouldn't have been on hbo all the time no not at all alongside predator and whatever else was out at that time <laughs> um so racky racky gets the boot racky gets the boot and great foreshadowing and- you'll be seeing me around you know That's right knocks That's over right. some sticks gets out of there so like again another example of excellent foreshadowing and then we shouldn't waste any more time. We should probably introduce the love interest at this point, like mm-hmm. literally right in that moment. So why is she there? Why? <laughs> why is she at the hockey rink during track? She's she's a high school student, right? Because when I was a kid, I saw her as a college student. But obviously, she's she's high school. I, I couldn't make heads or tails. She oh. has to be because how much statutory rape is in this movie? It's Miss McGill and Rob Lowe. And then if she's in college. Right. I mean, is that correct? I mean, I, I don't like to throw that term around. It's not no. a funny thing to joke about. No, but it said he is 17. Yeah, yeah, he definitely. And when he's well, he doesn't mention that until the end of the movie. And I remember. So when I went back and rewatching, he's like, yeah, I'm 17. I went, no, you're not. You just that, he's like 21 in real life. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, so she's yeah, in high school. Let's just say she's in high school to make the movie more palatable, yeah. you know. So she's in high school. And, well, we we meet this this girl roaming the halls of the hockey for ring. some reason. Yeah, yep. for some reason, which we'll find out later. It does make a little bit of sense, but I still I don't know. Given how who whom her father is, I'm shocked that that was OK. But that's right. That's here nor there. So Racky's like, I'm out of here. You'll see me soon. I'll see you mm-hmm. soon. And, and I like that moment, by the way, before he goes out, he, he pauses. Dean goes after him with a stick to try and show him who's who's boss. And I love that moment where he just like pauses and he goes, shit. And he like and he leaves. It's just, it's just a nice beat to take. I and think, he just misses Dean as well. So just great. great I also talking. think it adds a a mountain of humility to Racky's character. I really do that. Like right. just in Agreed. that one frame, that one beat where we have that you go, oh. He's not a fucking asshole completely. Like he actually he's does. Human, yeah, right? yeah, it's dude. Well done. Yeah, yeah. It's well done. Yeah. And as uh as uh Dean Youngblood chases him out there, well, 
He's in his naked. Shots. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because why are you? That's why? that's, that's because it's because it's Guba Peter's production. You need a nice Roblo ass. That's why. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't it, make any sense. You at least like throw on like some hockey shorts or something, you know, if you're really going to do that. Incidentally, like one other thing I want to mention, I know we're like really dragging with this, but there's a lot to cover with this movie. Some something else in this movie does really well is ADR, which is not easy to do. And it, it's consistent throughout, meaning the stuff that was recorded either like away from the scene on set or after the fact in post-production. But as he's grabbing the stick and going out, like as he's being sewn up, you hear like, you know, uh, uh, he says, how many stitches? And then the trainer says, ah, oh, looks good for about six. And you hear six, oh, seven, eight, you know, you hear a lot of like the peanut gallery in the background. And as fast forward, he's grabs a stick, he goes after Racky, you hear like, oh, go get him killer. Dun, 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 dun. And so there's a lot of great sound design and ADR throughout this movie. That's another example of it. I agree. So, I agree. Meet Cynthia Gibb. Yep. Uh, we, we meet half Cynthia. naked. Yep. She's just staring at his ass, just staring at his asshole. And I guess I, at that time, during that time, I guess I would have too. <laughs> um, I, I think I would have too, if I was her. I mean, it's not something that you see very that's often. Very you know? handsome man. There's no doubt about it. Yes, he is, he is definitely never played so it, hockey a day in his life, but he is very no. handsome. And the only reason I say that is because of this particular scene after uh, him and uh, Cynthia. W- wait a minute. What's her fucking what's her character name? Jesse. 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 Chadwick. It's not even said she's not properly introduced. You know, it's never like, hi, I'm Jesse. Hi, I'm. But I don't in this movie, you don't need it later in the movie. He calls out to her. So you get her name. But again, it, this movie doesn't waste words, I, although I do think. This is one of the few scenes where like the pacing is a bit off, like it lingers too much. So he's stuck. He could have just said like, where's the locker room? Just, just, just fucking ask, you know? But it's just that kind of like awkward, like, let me try this door. Let me try this door. And then she's sitting there like, mm, oh, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> Okay. Well, you that's our that comedic element. <laughs> that's our comedic element. We had to have a little yeah, comedy in there, and we yeah, do and have there more is good do- comedy. Yeah. Well, you know, you pick up the wrong book sometimes, and you try to get away with it. Oh, that was great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. um, but the well, the thing that I wanted to say is, you know, Rob Lowe's never played a day of hockey in his life, and I only say that because as that scene comes to a close with his naked butt cheeks out, he pretends to stick handle in the hallway. You saw, it, okay. Um, you're just like me. I see those things too. Why? Yeah, I mean, they, nude stick handling, like, ew. and you know, she's right there. I mean, maybe he's like, you know, he's being, he's peacocking it a little bit, you know, he's showing off his plumage. <laughs> and I was just watching. I was like, that my man's never stick handled anything in his life. <laughs> Ever. He's never, he's was like, it bad? I didn't even. Oh, know dude. That. Like it, it made me dude. It made me cringe where I was just like, oh, he's this is only like his seventh time holding a hockey stick ever. And okay. the six other times were in the scenes previous or whatever they shot you know, beforehand. I, I, see, I, I was more lenient with his hockey acumen and and heart and and more like judgmental about his acting. I think his acting was passable. I think he does comedy well, but I think some of the dramatic moments are very soap opery again. Love the movie. I love him in this, but like like I mentioned, you know, just part of the love of this movie is flaws and all. And so um, I did not notice he had a great double, but I didn't notice him himself looking weird skating or stick handling or really anything. So that's interesting that you picked that out. It's very the, so it happens. It's very sparingly. So a lot of the times, like you're talking about with the double, is yeah, the double skates. Double is great. But there's a couple scenes, and actually including uh, Patrick Swayze. So after they they go out to the bar and they get hammered or whatever, that's mm-hmm. th- you can tell that's actually Patrick Swayze and Rob Lowe skating there. Which I I was like, oh okay, so they're they're not that bad, you know, whatever. Okay. Right. In in the case, I urge you to go back and take a look at that because actually okay. the way that uh, uh, Sutton Patrick Swayze gets on and hops on his horse during that sequence i'm like oh mm-hmm. shit patrick can skate patrick can i think run. he was a figure skater I, I think he i mean he was a great athlete he was a martial artist i i read somewhere that he was a figure skater he's a dancer so you know he has balance and he's an, he's a natural athlete okay so so again once again we have a nice cut the next scene is the bar right where they're where they're drinking and they're and the team you show we see that the team starts to accept rob Lowe, which is nice so he's at the end it, it's again it's blocked so well Rob Lowe is at the end of the table, the, the lowest man on the totem pole, the newest guy, the more established core of the team is at the head of the table with Patrick Swayze at the head, his right-hand man, Hewitt, next to him. And then the rest, you know, the guy with the dentures, Keanu Reeves playing a Quebec quad. Like, what is he? I, I don't understand a thing he is saying in this entire I don't. I don't know why he's there. Maybe they, maybe 
maybe the foreshadow there was we think this guy's going to be a star throw him a bone and they were correct because i love keanu reeves but he's just like indecipherable in this movie well so before we actually get to the bar i do want to point out that there are two sequences in there remember i sent you that screen cap of what somebody had wrote um yes yes uh, yes so i do think that uh, it's not justified you don't you don't say that but there is a scene in between going to the bar where I feel may have prompted this individual to say what they did. And there's a hazing sequence where they shave, uh, shave his balls. Yeah. They shave with his balls. a blunt <laughs> butter knife. No, you didn't. No, you didn't shave anybody with that knife. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, and on top of that too, like I, I'm still squirming. Like he, he does make him stop squirm it you know he's just like is that before the bar that was before the bar because they they buy him drinks after they shave his nose okay yeah right i'm sorry i didn't mean to bypass that the the hazing scene cringe the hazing that's a cringy scene that is a very you don't need you don't need that but then we balance it with if you know you're a young kid growing up in the 80s watching this movie then because we have the shaving sequence followed by the miss mcgill sequence Oh, I'm sorry Uh, i I, I skipped over a bunch of stuff which well yeah because t with miss mcgill said in the bar okay yeah 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 so and I can remember and again, like I know that this is not this is not okay. This is what what happens in that sequence with Miss McGill is not okay. However, if you are a young kid in the eighties, oh, who plays oh. hi- <laughs> so I just I'm think- a grown man now. I'm okay with that. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I was like, I was watching. I was like, Miss McGill's still gorgeous, isn't she? She's still she, what? Okay, I'm. I'm I, this is probably easy to look up, but I'm just ballparking. What 40? 40 years old? Is she younger than that? As a kid, she looked very old to me, especially with that haircut. As an adult, I'm like, she's probably. She, I'm sure she's younger than me now. Yeah, yeah, and well, and not. Yeah, she she had to be at least. 40. I'm guessing 40. Yeah, and I was still just like, oh man, what a what a gnarly. I, I think I'm going to go try out for a hockey team. <laughs> so, th- so this is interesting. So when I was a kid watching this movie, uh, she opens the door. This is where he's staying. Um, and then she walks up the stairs and you get the shot of her like very short shorts, giving you the cue that maybe this person's like very like flirty. And so as a kid, I never understood that scene. I'm like, what? And, and you go back to a close up of Rob Lowe kind of like, hmm looking at it curiously, like, what's happening here? And as a kid, that co- totally confused me. I mean, I, I was 10 when I saw this. And I just, I, I'm like, oh, why, why is that old woman wearing underwear, cleaning the house? <laughs> yeah. So I, I didn't get it as a kid. I understand it now, of course. But uh, yeah, totally went over my head when I first saw this movie. I will say, isn't it kind of, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's good or bad, but seeing it now that I'm older and as she's going through the hockey cards, I was just like, yeah this is kind of uncomfortable. Like at the time, like you don't understand what's going on. And now as you're watching it when you're older, I'm like, oh damn, like that's actually kind of fucked up. (laughs) And I'm sorry if this is excessive, but I thought the outfit that she had on cleaning was far hotter than the outfit she put on to seduce Dean when she went up with the tea. She looked like, like colonial. Like I'm like, just keep, keep what you're wearing minus the gloves, unless you're into that, which is like some kind of fetish. I'm sure. But um uh, everything's a fetish dude every yeah. every fucking thing's a goddamn fetish so, so here, here's my solution to this problem don't make him 17 just make him 18 why can't you just make him 18 he's clearly not it's so easy is he a high school dropout working on a farm like that was never addressed i mean patrick swayze said hell i didn't get to finish high school later in the movie so uh but dean doesn't look like he comes from the kind of family that would allow him to leave school he seems to have the kind of father that would say at least you know, you're going to graduate even if you work on this farm, but that's neither here nor there. Just just make him 18 and none of these. This is not a problem, but or, yeah, whatever. I'll, I'll Peter's Gruber, a, <laughs> John Peters. I'll, I'll put a finer point on 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 or I'll add to what you're saying. Don't mention the fucking name or the age at all. Like, right. I, I don't need to. Easy, these are easy solution. Yeah, these are young dudes trying to break into the NHL. I don't need to know. They could be x to you know x just to i assume they're all out of high school you know what i mean like so yep. that this is instead of college they're here then everything makes so much more sense but whatever moving on like it could it could have solved the problem easily i think in the 80s there might have been too much cocaine to allow that judgment to come to fruition is my guess i do miss cocaine filmmaking though man i really do to a certain yeah. extent i are talking about one right now <laughs> um so uh, they go out to the bar and it turns out uh as you see later in the night, 
Yeah, everyone's uh, everyone appears to be drinking, but really Dean is the only one towards the end that's actually drinking these shots of tequila as the boys. Yeah, yeah, the rest of the boys are throwing them out, Uh, by the way. Still a good prank these days, taking out your fake teeth and putting it in some lady's drink. That's still I didn't understand that as an adult. I still like why? Why? uh, To gross them out. I get that, but it's like. I don't know. I, I guess that's just like one of those puerile jokes that boys will be boys. No, I get it. Like I've been around sports teams. I've been around military. I've been around like law enforcement, like, you know, like the kind of like the dog mentality. Like I get that humor. It's just, I don't have it. So whenever I see those kinds of things, I'm like, yeah, I, I guess that's funny. But like, I've always been an outsider in, in those like kind of alpha male circles. So to me, it's like, eh. no, I'm with works. You. I'm with you. In fact, it, it was charms them. Me. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it was more like, Hey, that's that's kind of funny, but I'm glad he's doing it. Not not me. Like, I'm just going to sit here and watch it unfold. I'm not Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be the one ripping my teeth out and put it in there. But but so now uh, Dean gets all fucked up, learning some learning some rookie mistakes, learning some rookie mistakes early. The boys are getting you all hammered, but you got practice uh, early in the a.m. And wouldn't you know it? Dean's dragging ass and everybody else is kind of giggling at him. So, yeah. And again, a great transition. You you smash cut. Oh, by the way, just one little throwaway in that uh, scene that I really like. Again, just really good ADR is when the team is fake drinking. So Dean takes a shot. The team throws it over the shoulder or whatever. Uh, You have a funny moment where she throws the Bloody Mary with the celery stick in it over her shoulder and the, so uh, Sutton throws his tequila over and he hits the guy and he goes, hey, what are you doing? God damn it. You know, it's like a, like it, it's a good it's it's little, but it's a good like these guys don't care. This is like a group of wolves and they're going to do whatever they want. They're going to have you know, they're going to they're going to drink. They're going to carouse and like anybody around is is unnecessary. So I, I kind of like those little moments there. It's like it's a small throwaway moment, but it it sets up the characters and and the tone really well anyway. So in the salt bit, also on. the the salt bit works, uh, always works because uh, uh, fellow hockey player Cam Neely and Dumb and Dumber got hit with the uh, sea bass got hit with the salt right. shaker and in, in dumb and dumb i i only bring up cam neely because he was a bruiser for the bruins so if we're doing a hockey the hockey podcast if you have right. an opportunity to bring up i mean i can't top you you had fucking wayne gretzky on the phone before we started rolling i'm bringing up cam neely WG. Not, not, <laughs> w, w, uh, me and dub g going out for drinks tonight <laughs> <laughs> um all right so after practice uh we have one of the more Hollywood magic moments in the film where the crossing of paths between our, our love interest and Dean, Dean just happens to be walking down the street. And I, and, and, oh, and yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, we we got to go back real quick to the, I, I know this is going to be a long ass review, but like I just, so the hockey action in the practice was so well done. I, I think that was, this is one of my favorite sequences in the movie. And it shows that the director knows hockey. It shows that the coach is excellent. He, he basically runs his unit like a military. I like, the idea of seeing Dean dragging ass through practice with uh, with a hangover. And again, here's another great ADR moment. Like in the middle of all that, he's kind of down. He, he just says, fuck me. Just a nice little throw in. Like you could just like really feel this guy struggling. And then you fast forward to the drill where they throw the puck in the corner and he sends Sutton and uh, it's just it's just set up so well. He goes, uh, Young blood and uh, Sutton, and then you hear the you know the kind of rumbling. Oh, eat him up, Derek! Again, like great sound design, great ADR. Throws in the corner. All right, who wants it? And they go. Sutton checks him. Dean just falls like a sack of potatoes. And then I love that moment when when Swayze's going back to the circle and he looks back and he has that <laughs> like whatever kind of laugh he does. Just so many great subtle moments like that in this movie. Uh, and then the coach goes over and he kind of mocks him. He says, Hey, you want to, you want some milk and cookies? And then you get that moment where Rob looks over to the, to the crew. And then the packages stand there almost like, just like, what is this dude doing? You know, it's just, it's, it's so uncomfortable in the best way where you really feel what Rob Lowe is feeling where, you know, it's, it's a new guy trying to make it. And the old guard is just like looking at him extremely skeptically. Anyway, moving on, moving on from the oh, practice. Yeah, and, yeah. No, it works perfectly. We have to have that scene. Who's it going to be? Who's going to be the new face of the Mustangs? And I think this is where we start to mm-hmm. pose that question to the audience. You know, yeah, even though, he's you going know, through his rites of passage. And then and then you and you exit the scene with the, all right, go hit it. You know, and they, they all skate away. It's just it's a great 
you know, transition from from one scene to the next. Them all skating in a pack and Rob Lowe kind of like following the the established players going to the next scene. It just like all almost every scene transition really works for me. They're they're so well done. Moving on. Yeah. Crossing paths. Yeah, the, the crossing pieces. path. That that one just the only I mean it's it's movie magic for you. And I think the only reason I I, I take it personally is because like I just want one of these fucking moments to happen to me. Like it reminds me <laughs> of the first fucking the, the first sequence of true romance. Like dude, whoever I whatever woman I see at midnight watching a double feature kung fu film. I'm I'm right. just gonna ask her to marry me. Like that's I don't I don't even need to know her name. I, you you want to yeah. get married? And similar to Young Blood is he's just walking down the street, just you know whatever a brisk evening. And who's leaving a movie by themselves? By themselves, which is you know it's just again movie magic. Got their pop small town though. I, yeah, okay. I actually found this believable because it's like they they really build this town up to be like there's not a lot of people. In fact, during this conversation, I think she even says. I can't find people here to talk to, you know? So what movie is she watching incidentally? I don't remember what movie. Was oh, yeah, that, that, that was on and the marquee. Just... And it was called back later in the movie. It was, just, it was Brink Stevens slumber party massacre. <laughs> God damn it. Yes, you're right. Now I remember it. Now I remember it. And it was the first one, not the third, right? I, first. Yeah. It was that, so it was the 82 movie playing in 85. That, that makes sense. I mean, that, again, a nice attention to detail. I don't know if this was actually playing in that theater when they were shooting or if they set designed it. But nonetheless, it shows this is like kind of a three year old movie, again, indicative of a town that's like kind of slow and sleepy. They don't need the most recent one. It's just like some random, you know, f low budget flick from a few years ago. So, again, like really nice. Yeah, well, it's got that drive in life to it. Slumber, mm -hmm. slumber. It's it, you you can I, and we still we still do that. Actually, in my town, our drive in plays two, three year old movies. But I, I heard I read the other day that our drive ins closing down and I almost if I had the money, I'd fucking buy it right right now, because I think drive ins are like one of the last. Well, let's not get into that um, anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we have that scene where they meet each other. And this is where we kind of turn comical. They He f ends up after she's just like, hey, deuces, if you're you know, you're not hanging out with me. But it was nice. He slow stalks her. Yes. Yes. Similar to that scene in Birdemic where the girl's walking and that creepy dude. Is, did you see Birdemic? No, I did not. OK, there's, it's so Birdemic is one of those films that's reviewed endlessly because it's just like super kind of like just I don't know how else to put it, just bad filmmaking. And there's a very awkward scene at the beginning where the love interest is kind of like leaving. And then the 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 male who is going to pursue her is like, hey, how are you? And she's like, OK, bye. And then they just do this like walk and it just goes. It's interminable. It goes on forever. And it's in this part. This scene in Young Blood reminds me a tiny bit of that, even though Birdemic came out years and years later. But it's a, it's a little awkward. She's like leaving, and he's kind of like slowly, kind of like walking behind her, and she's okay with it. So I just, yeah, just want to tell weird. you a, a story live on air because you just all you said the phrase bad filmmaking, and I just want, I, if not only to you, but to just have on record, this has absolutely no bearing on Young Blood at all. I just re uh, reviewed an action film about two months ago, and I. I basically said everything, but it was terribly executed, terribly done. Like you didn't take time on it at all, blah, blah, blah. That writer director put my name on his poster and said, I loved this film. Nice. And I, I just want you to know, sir, if you're listening to this right now, that's not cool, dude. <laughs> that's that's not cool guys i definitely i was trying to be nice don't get me wrong but uh i loved it so much i saw it twice and then you put it on your fucking marquee i i don't know how you I took some creative liberties that's pretty common in filmmaking just a little bit dude just yeah. a little bit and, and don't um, get me wrong like i'm usually very positive on this film but then when i saw this poster with all you know quotes from the critics up in front of the movie theater and i see my name on there i should have been overjoyed seth i was not <laughs> infamous or infamous either one works <laughs> yeah anyway anyway bad filmmaking so yeah so he so, grabs so they're in the bookstore and she buy and then so she's okay with him not taking the hint and, and shoving off because you could tell it's it set up that she likes him but she's not trying to get involved because she knows where this is going to end. He's on his, uh, you know, her, her father's team and it's just not going to be an ideal situation. Nonetheless, she clearly likes him. And so she's doing that internal war where I like this guy. I know I shouldn't, but I'm just going to see what plays out. So she's not giving them like the, the hard shrug off, just like a mild. So he follows where they go in the bookstore. She buys him Moby Dick. 
he uh, kind of, I, I see, I think Rob Lowe does comedy very well throughout this movie. And, and I think this movie has a, a lot of comedic elements that work. They're not out of place. And so he, she leaves to go pay for Moby Dick and he kind of grabs Nympho, which is, uh, is Nympho, is that what it's called? So yeah. a book with like a naked female on the front. And then uh, I think he's, he, he's reading through it and then she catches him. And then he puts it back and then he takes and then he pays with, I think, American money, which is why that clerk is holding up the bill. Like, what is this? Yeah. And they encounter. And so they, here's one of the reveals. So they're walking together. They encounter the coach who also happens to be her father. So more conflict. Yeah. And and if and if Dean, you know, Dean's got an up and battle now, because uh, when he asked what uh, the coach asked what you guys are doing, he's like, oh, uh, getting books. And he, of course, pulls out pulls out Nympho. Good yes. moment. And and Ed Lauder, who plays Murray Chadwick, started as a comedian, which I didn't know until we did this review. But I was looking up at his past and because I'm thinking he plays those moments very well. And he just kind of gives like a like a raised eyebrow like and I just like how he doesn't overreact. And I think this movie in general doesn't overreact. And I think that's just like the subtle, well-developed characters where they're just like it, they're all comfortable relationships to me in, in that sense. So I like how he makes a huge fuck up where the, the girl he's interested in father, he's holding up a porno you know, novel in, in front of him. And he and, and he just kind of like oh, he's, you know, mortified. And he just plays it off like, all right, just be home in an hour or whatever. I, I just like how it doesn't it doesn't go crazy. You know, these are all likable characters and they're just like this is like these are all normal reactions, not a stupid Hollywood reaction, you know, a hundred percent. Yeah. And we and I would I agree with everything minus. But I think we downplay everything until the end which we we'll get to here in a moment right. momentarily where I do think we go kind of batshit insane only yeah. from a sports aspect not a film right. aspect just a right. sports aspect so anyway uh what do we got i think we so, so so they they basically say goodbye they, they have a nice conversation where they where they talk a little bit about their backgrounds again and, and i'm somebody who has no patience for needless exposition but because the writing in this movie is so good because they don't waste words it's just really well done he talks about being from a small town and trying to make it she talks about being from new york city and not really being content with being in a small town it's just and then and then they kind of end it where it's like she says you're a hockey player given the situation it's just not a good idea and again i like how he doesn't fight it he's like he clearly likes her but he's like okay he accepts that and he says do you, you want to ride home no i'm good bye it's just it's just really well done you don't see that a lot in movies. Nobody's fucking psycho. They're just talking. She says, I don't think this is a good move. He's like, okay. And, and even though I don't love Rob Lowe's performance in this movie, although I think his strongest performances are the comedic, he does, he does that kind of strong, silent type really well. So when he's not trying to be like overly upset, I think that's his, his weakest moments in this movie. I think these are his strongest moments where he is just like, he doesn't have to say too much. He's going to like, and not only that, but the scenes still move fast. So you get the best of both worlds. It's, it's not superfluous dialogue. It's not slow pacing. It's just like, it's good, clean, crisp storytelling. Well done. So just a great scene. Well done. It, it was, it, even though personally I was annoyed that we had to end everything. We just had this wonderful evening. You know, we got Moby Dick. We we got the, the <laughs> bow book. We met dad and everything. And and she does kind of, again, that very structured um, response of, hey, I don't date hockey players. I can't do this. So and you know I was, that's not going to stick. Yeah. And I'm just sitting there like, ah, I know. And, and I knew like as I'm watching it, we have to have this like I knew that, you know, but in, in, in right. my heart, I was like, no, babe, I can play hockey. Why are you leaving? You know, like I, I'm making it. I'm I'm Rob Lowe in this sequence where you, you want him to fight it a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like how or how about we fall on our face first? Like I do something. How about if you catch me with Miss McGill? But, you know, we weren't we weren't set in stone yet. You and I, Jesse. But you call me right. with Miss McGill. OK, then we come back around. Or would that be right. too 80 ish? 80s ish <laughs> right yeah like the, kind of like the bizarre love triangle yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i kept that, it simple i like it yeah okay so now we go is this the first game next up yeah uh, smash yeah. cut yep. it's nice because it's an it's a nice dramatic scene with a good score that ends on like a high note hey i like you you like me but it's just it's bad timing boom now you get the bus coming towards you similar to the shot where you cut from the kitchen at the beginning to the trans am coming towards you showing the passage of time and and the next action going to the tryout here it's the bus coming towards you going to the first game. So there you go. Playing uh, 
the mini Toronto Maple Leafs. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, great costume design because <laughs> it, it was it 100% is 80s mm. Maple Leafs jerseys that they just kind of <laughs> mocked up a little yeah. bit. One right. point in the scene, though, before they actually take the ice, something that's kind of dated. And again, like I noticed the dumbest shit. And I just so you yeah, know, me too. Yeah, I, just so you know, I only set this at least the Zoom recording to go until two. <laughs> so. So what time not, are we at now? So that's like at one thirty nine here. So we oh got God. 21. Yeah, we 20, have to get through the rest of this movie in 20 minutes. I well, the only thing I can think of, because like I and I, I shouldn't have done this. I just should have. But I didn't anticipate us you part one, part two. Yeah. Talking for more than two hours. But like what I always <laughs> do this where I should just set it for five hours because I know I'm never going to have a five hour conversation. But once you do the time limit, like I'll actually get a countdown like, hey, we're closing this meeting in four minutes. And it's my, like, my my suggestion is just do part one, part two. So let this wrap and then just send me send me a different link because we're never going to get through this movie in 20 minutes. It can't happen. It's impossible. No, it's good. In fact, we can take a break once we in 20 minutes anyway, because I got to pee again. So we're, we're all right. We're, all we're right. All good. Give, give, give me the give me like a five minute heads up and then we'll wrap that. And then when you have five minutes left, let's just wherever we have a wrap. We'll call that part one. Then we'll go part two because it's an epic movie. So it's going to be an epic podcast. And and I think we're only like halfway through it. <laughs> so, Not even. All yeah. right. We'll, we'll speed it up for the for the audience listening. We're, we're going to get all the major points. But we'll we'll yeah. expedite our, our but, pace. So. But I did want to mention this. So they're they're going into their first game, first playoff games, first, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. Dean's Dean's about to, you know, make mm-hmm. his appearance or whatever. And just showing the datedness of the time, the cortisone shots. I know that this doesn't have nobody. Nobody gives a shit. But I just mm-hmm. again, I'm sitting there watching going, oh, man, like a lot's changed. You, we don't just dole out cortisone shots anymore in sports. Like, in fact, it's it's really bad for you that they've learned to take all those shots and i was just thinking different time different place i'm watching all of them getting shots in in the locker room i I like the moment where hewitt is clearly the tough guy of the team but again really great subtle character development almost across the board minus keanu reeves and the dentures guy like they just didn't need to be there but like hewitt is is well developed where like he is a tough guy nothing hurts him but when he's getting that shot he has a moment of like you know he, he it hurts, you know, so I, I, I like that. Just little moments are they're, they're a nice touch. And uh, I believe Diener scores his first goal here. Uh, be, but before we get to the game, uh, the coach comes in, the guy's like uh, doing his hair and he goes, let me ask you something. How can you think, be thinking about the game when you're styling your hair five minutes before it's going to start? And then he kind of does a thing where he says, this is the one, right? Where he says, sometimes I, wor- I, I wonder if the players got it in here, you know, and then he kind of goes through it. It sets up the coach as an old school coach who talks about when Gordie Howe got his uh, first deal, he got a team jacket. And then you see some, of, and then you see the discrepancy between the coach and the players where the players like, hey, what a team jacket, lousy agent. You know, I, I like those moments where it like shows the divide between the coach, the coach level and the player level. It's the generational gap. It's just, it's well done. And he's not being an asshole about it. He's just trying to get these kids to, you know, have that hard nosed mentality like they did back in the day and the kids are resisting. I'm sure in any fast forward to any year, you'll have that, you know, 10 to 20 year gap regardless. It turns out that he was fucking right because we hear Derek later in the film. Like I've been doing this a long time. Like I'm trying, I'm trying to get to the final stage. Like I want my money, right. you know? Right. So the, the coach did in fact, <laughs> hit the nail on the head. Um, yeah. And, and so Dean scores his first goal. And when he does, yeah. this is where Jesse erupts in the in the classroom, mm-hmm. taking mm-hmm. taking finals. Great set design. How do we pass or how do we sell it as a school? Put up a blackboard and just write finals on the back. And we got ourselves a, a, a and quiet, a, yeah. quiet, yeah. Yeah. subtle, yeah. you know, because it says quiet. And then she like, yeah, you know, she does that outburst. So that was a nice touch as well. Yeah. And 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 actually, like because it's an 80s film because of what it's about i want that moment actually which is mm. ironic for me because i for you would think that i i would like let's let's get let's get out of those moments but no no um so game over right and we we gotta he's, he's bent well but he's benched so because he's seeing uh, the, the coach has an inclination that young blood is interested in his daughter so as soon as he scores the goal he's benched and then i think this is the game right and then when he when he's bench, he looks over at Sutton like, "What the hell? I just scored!" And then and then Derek gives him a look like, mm, you know, "That's the way it goes." And then in the locker room, so they're excited. 
They come back to the locker room, really nice entrance shot. Everybody's happy. One guy slaps Rob Lowe on the ass, like basically like now he's being included in the team. He's being accepted. So like these little touches are, are these are nice touches that, that give you, uh, they say a lot that you, you're saying a lot with a minimal movement, which, which I always appreciate. And then they do this thing. So this kills me in movies. So Rob Lowe, so again, he's very immature throughout most of this movie. So he's a pouty little kid. He scored the goal. He doesn't understand why he's benched. So then he takes the puck that Patrick Swayze so graciously like flipped to him, you know, so now he's going to throw it out like an asshole. So this is the thing that movies do sometimes. So when he throws the puck, you cut from a shot of him throwing it to a shot of the trash can. It doesn't match. That puck is in the air way too long. And, and it reminds me of the scene in Lethal Weapon. Have you seen Lethal Weapon? Yeah. Okay. It reminds me of the scene in Lethal Weapon where, uh, where Mel Gibson and Danny Glover are talking outside the home after they have dinner at Danny Glover's house. And then, uh, you know, uh, I think it's like a beer bottle. He, he throws something out and then Danny Glover holds up the trash. And from Mel's throw to Danny Glover's trash can, it doesn't match. It's in the air way too long. So it's like, you know, if I'm throwing this, it's like if I go like this and then it, one, two, three, then you cut to. So like in, in lethal. Oh God, no, we were doing so well there. And now oh, are you back now? Okay. We just, we just had a quick frozen. We had yeah. a frozen moment there for a second. Yeah. You, you froze for a second. Yeah. Oh, but God. the point is like that, that didn't match. Like these are the things that I noticed, like the continuity, that's continuity. I'm like, nah, that fuck is defying gravity, but what minor point that's more of like a filmmaker. eye, I guess. So the best lethal weapon, just real quick, we're not going to talk about your favorite lethal weapon. Is it one? one, one. Okay. So I'm going to say close. one or four. I know I'm trash, but Jet Li, I love Jet Li. Okay. Until they put me in the ground. I love Jet Li and Good Joe Pesci. Guy. And Joe Pesci. Okay. 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 You know? <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, so the game's over. Game's over. Yeah. Uh, we, we're all feeling pretty good about ourselves, with the exception of Dean, who just tossed his fucking puck in the outing. Yeah. Yes, yes, he is. First professional goal, and he threw it away <laughs> because he's an immature asshole pouting. So again, this character, flaws and all, you know, he's very immature throughout a lot of this movie. Yep. And, and I and I do think, but there is still some reality to that. Like, kind mm -hmm. of, I can sure. remember feeling those moments in games before. Like, and and for me, it was always when I was getting benched so somebody else uh, could play. Like, you know, like we're up a ton of runs or whatever. And I would still like take that personal. Like I would be like MJ, you know, and I took that personal like I, I every time. So I do right. sort of understand what uh, Dean is going through in that moment where it, it feels like, yeah, you did it. But it almost feels like in some way it was taken away from you. You know, it's right. almost like yeah. a, I mean, he is 17 in this movie or should have been 18. But like, yeah, I mean, he is a young kid. So sure, it makes sense. It's part of his character. Yes. And then we have another very Sean gets lost in the movie magic moment where I just really wanted this to happen to me is chatting with your your love interest, the the person that you're attracted to while you're both on a Zamboni. <laughs> yeah. So like because I that's the love I, Zamboni. Yeah, dude. Like I like those. Like those are the like. I'm fine with those very over the top moments that apparently she just takes finals in high school. And then she just comes and works at the hockey rank exclusively, even though like we, you and I have already yeah. talked, uh, talked about, it's not, it's, it's not specifically discussed that they are anything but the coach and daughter in there. It's not like we say, right. Oh, they own the rink and they've, they're the ones right. keeping hockey in this town, whatever. Yeah. I'm, I'm bad. I, I buy her having a job, you know, driving the Zamboni more than I do her lurking in the hallways during tryouts. That didn't make sense. That girl, a high school girl is going to be home with her friends, whatever. She's not going to be like, although they do set it up as her kind of hanging out in like the Zamboni room. Like that's kind of like, like a goat. You never see her in her room at home. You only see her at the, in, in like the, the side room at the rink so it's just uh, she she's a rink rat she actually now there. now that i think about it it actually does that scene the scene where we see rob lowe's ass it does make sense they're done with practice she's coming to do this, this she's coming to zamboni the the rink because they're done <laughs> i take this back you do see when they're in the playoffs at thunder bay she is in a room watching on tv when Derek gets taken out she's watching from like a much cozier room in the ring so one time they do show her at home so she does have a home <laughs> she's here. moving on so 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 uh so they meet up while she's at her day job driving the zamboni 
he does kind of a funny thing where he, you know, he, he tries to stop her. She tries to ignore him. Then he pretends to fall down in front of it, leaves his boot, which is a nice touch, yep. sneaks up behind her. And then he says, uh, hockey players love the sight of blood, especially their own. So like, it, again, it, like, it's a nice moment. Rob Lowe does comedy very well throughout this movie. It's a nice moment ruined by a shit date idea by Dean. You were going to take this girl ice skating. This is she all took, she know? took him there. Oh, she took him. There. Okay. Because well, when like, they're, when they're walking up, he says, is this where all the young people come? And then she says, here's the callback. Hey, it's either this or Slumber Party Massacre. Again, showing you that this is like the smallest town in all of Canada. Okay, okay. You've turned the tides, but I still say, then let's go see Slumber Massacre. I don't give a shit that you already. I right. just, it, it's a weird choice. <laughs> it's an odd choice. It's, I, I think it's there to set up the uh, Canadian uh, rink guard. That, that bit. Yeah. Well, and that's what I was going to say. Talk about an odd choice. How... So anyway, they, they go on the date and he's he's pretending that he can't skate very well until um, they kind of get the referee, the lifeguard, the yeah. I, <laughs> the, the rink, the, the so rink he, he gets entangled, pulls her down on top of him. Nice move, by the way, as like pretty yes. slick. And then and then the uh, the Canadian, the uber Canadian, like very Rick Moranis vibes from this guy with the glasses and the snow cap. He's like, hey, are you guys OK over there on the ice? And then, you know, they kind of laugh it off. See, and this is this is the only like quasi mean spirited moment of the movie I didn't like. It's like he's trying to help, and so like, and then they're like, "Yeah, we're we're fine." It's his first time. Then he's skating away, and I think to make him less likable, they threw in the ADR line, "Damn kids," because other he he looks like he's he's honestly trying to help them. Like, you better look out, or you're gonna get run over. Very Rick Moran is Canadian, like soup. You couldn't be more Canadian than this guard, this rink lifeguard. So, so as he's skating away, he looks back as if to like make sure they're okay. But I think they threw in that ADR like damn kids because they 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 fuck him up. So, so we're gonna play a little pretend here. We're gonna play a little pretend. So, in this pretend, you are now the writer director of Young Blood. You are now Peter. Okay, mm -hmm. I have a question for you, Peter. What's with the birthday cake? At the, <laughs> what was with the the choice to go with the birthday cake at the end of this? The, I, the hijinks I, and shenanigans. I feel like. <laughs> Peter Markle hated that bit, but the producer's like, yeah, you need a wacky bit in the middle of the movie where somebody jumps into a cake. I totally see. I mean, having been in countless meetings and development and production and post-production, I, I, I just envision myself. I just envision like the, like the Michael Mannish director, like, like having, like having to have that Clint Eastwood, like, like uh like uh dissatisfied like ugh, grunt throughout a lot of making this movie where the producers are like yeah we need to, we need to get some more ass in the scene i, I want to see more ass yeah we're originally from new york but then we moved out to los angeles now we're producing movies people want to see asses and tits they want to see cakes and uh you know it's like that i i totally see this being a studio and or producer influence where like you need to get some comedy in here why, why can't you have the uh the ring god fall into a cake face first that's hilarious my gr my grand my uncle did that at uh my grand uh, whatever like family function and i couldn't stop laughing so i i and in fact kevin smith during his uh dvd talks has several really good stories about john peters about how John Peters wanted to inject this and that into this movie. So I could, I could totally see these, either this producer specifically or these kinds of producers inserting those broad moments where it's like, okay, let's have them fall down in kind of a playful way, but you know, we need more comedy here. What, can, can you get Rick Moranis? No, he's not available. Get, get uh, Roger Moranis, get his, get his brother. He's not his brother. Get, his, get, get, get Rick Moranis' cousin in here to play like a goofy uh, uh, rink god and have him fall face first into a cake. So that, that's kind of how I see that. That's why that's there. I, I don't and think center there. ice, I might add. I believe it was like at center ice and we hadn't seen it at center ice as the chase ensues. Magic. Like I was like, yes, yeah. I was like, where did that fucking cake come from? Um, you know what? needed the Pratt fall. <laughs> The I was producers just, wanted a, a pratfall. There you uh, go. Uh, well, maybe ask Wayne if that was something he told the producers. He he was a he was a 
uh, helped out uh, with uh, with production of Young Blood. And he's like, hey, I listen. I've been to a lot of birthday par- or skating parties. There's always cake center ice. There's- hey, you know what they have at all those uh, public skating uh, events? There's always a big uh, fruit platter in the in the center of the ice over there. Oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't see the cake there. Sorry, I fell face first into it. <laughs> um, you know what? Let's 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 take a break here. Let's take a break. Well, then, well, part one. Yeah, end of part one for the people that are watching YouTube. Make no, mm-hmm. never mind if you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Oh, you're gonna come. You're gonna combine these for the audio version. Ah, yeah, just for the audio version, right. it'll just be fine. So let's you and I hold up a second here, and this is intermission. This is an intermission. Should we? You want to take five? Take ten? Up to you, my friend. Let's let's take five and keep it rolling. All right, let's do it. All right, we're gonna take five here. We're going to end this right. Mia, I will send you another link here in a second. This is great YouTube for people watching right now. Behind the scenes, little BTS. I'll send you a yeah. link here in a second. All right, cool. <laughs> All right.